All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today and letting us into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. This is a KISS-related podcast by the board for the board. We hope that you enjoy. We'd love you to support this show. Please like, follow, and subscribe to us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Your likes and subscription helps us to grow and attract interviews and content. So please retweet and share our posts. Your contributions are appreciated. Welcome to episode 460 of the Kiss FAQ podcast. I'm your host, Julian Gill. I'm back in the saddle this week, back from Nashville. The boys held down the fort while I was gone. So first of all, guys, great show. Thank you so much for, you know, I, I don't feel like I can leave you guys home and worry about, you know, you burning the place down because it was a really entertaining <laughs> show. I enjoyed it. And also, you know, Mark, Julian's not here. We can go as long as we want. Uh, <laughs> it, it made my flight back, um, you know, it took up, you know, nearly half of the flight. So, so thank you very much. And you've also got some very good comments. So it's nice for me to be able to read some show comments uh, just for some of the feedback. Tim Cobb says, my favorite podcast, no egos, no misinformation, just friends discussing kiss. Great sense of humor as well. Fun episode. Yeah, thanks, Tim, for that. And yes, it was yeah. a very entertaining episode, and it is. We try to be positive and real. We don't need to act um, out and be anything that we're not. Um, Thomas Hubner, uh, I hope Gene does a real demon style heavy metal album with writing partners like Hetfield, Mustaine, Scotty, and, and John Schaefer. John Schaefer, oh. isn't that Iced Earth? Um, yes. Uh, th this is very fast riffing combined with Gene's hook, would fit very well. Well, everyone's got their own takes, tastes. Um, Jason Leonard, one of our big supporters. Jason, thanks for commenting twice. I definitely enjoy this episode. Ken and Mark both do a great job hosting when the teacher is away. I'd love to see other collectors' vinyl, um, and it always inspires me. And I'll, I'll read the platitude out. The Kiss FAQ is the single best podcast in the world, except no po uh, substitutes. Thank you very much, Jason. All right. Um, and how about one more? Um, let's see. Uh, M. Murphy, 3608. It's interesting to me how a lot of people who love Asylum don't like Crazy Nights. Um, <laughs> I always sort of think of them as sister albums. It might be because I was not really listening to Kiss when these two came out. And then when it did get them, I got them about the same time and thought them in, thought of them in similar terms. But I love them both. Yeah, you know, you know, I had to write a book to love crazy nights more than i did and it was only then that i really started to appreciate it more so thank you everyone for those comments uh bjorn again uh it, his name has nothing to do with uh abba but he does of course like abba so there we go all right so in news this week well i think first of all is mike brun podcast got doc in the hot seat and did a fantastic interview. Great job, Mike. Um, some very, I won't say revealing information. I'm not gonna say too much of it because I think you should go over and check out his show and check out some of his past episodes if you're not already familiar with it. Um, but Doc didn't shirk from the questions. It was a well-balanced, well-structured uh, interview and it had a good flow. And it, it didn't ask some of the questions that you wouldn't expect him to ask. So if you're expecting someone to be confrontational, rude, and obnoxious to Doc or to a band member when you interview them, you're just not going to see most people do that sort of stuff because you want them to be engaged and to stay in the room. And you also go through your questions, and sometimes questions that you have get bumped off from the answers that they've given. So, um, again, great job, Mike. Check it out. Highly recommended. Um, other news? Sunday, my review of the Poughkeepsie show is going to drop. It'll be, uh, mm. it won't be a podcast. It'll be, uh, you'll have to read, put on your glasses, and there'll be a PDF <laughs> down, download sheet that you can uh, print out if you so desire. Um, so, so that's something to look forward to on Sunday because, of course, now song stories are done for this series. The tenth one Ooh. was "Let Me Go Rock and Roll." Mm -hmm. um, so that's it until series. That was very three. good, by the way. Yeah, I had to fix. I I, I misspoke about um, the song not being performed on the end of the road tour. I meant to say obviously that it hadn't been 
performed in three oh. years because mm-hmm. it was dropped at the end of uh, I think it was ninety nine shows that it had, um, but it hasn't been performed since and hasn't returned. Yeah as the set has contracted so i did actually put up a new version of both those episodes because that would bug me forever um, (laughs) otherwise so i'm back from nashville and that is of course what this episode and i don't know this may be two episodes is going to be about i was able to you know interview several people while i was there but i want to give a shout out to chris sinzak the mighty aaron camaro tracy the whole team of volunteers who kept that show running all weekend. Um, Lonnie and Mark came to the first one with me back when it was in a, a tiny little venue in yeah. Nashville. And now he's basically in an airline hangar. I mean, it's absolutely massive and, and impressive um, how it has scaled. Here's a quick video of uh, just a walkthrough before the doors opened. So I'm here at the Rock and Pot Expo in Nashville, Tennessee. It's before the doors open. Setup was done yesterday. Chris Sinzak has put together an absolutely incredible venue. We're in Expo 3 down here at the Nashville Fairgrounds. For those of us who were part of Rock and Pod Expo at the very first one, it's really grown. There's so many great podcasts here, or who will be here today. Classic Rock Drops, Kiss Talk, Mike Williams, A to Z, A to Z Radio, the mighty Bill Elam, who uh, does the Wasp episodes with me on the Lucas Rock and Roll podcast, the powerful and attractive Ages of Rock, got Mistress Business, Neon Angels, I mean, look at these setups, the Rowdy Rocker, a lot of quality podcasts being generated at a grassroots event that's growing bigger and bigger each year because of the efforts of people like Chris and his team. Here we go, On the Rocks, Talk Louder. I don't know a lot of these shows in Obscure I've heard of. Um, you know, it's a good opportunity when you see all these people showing up. They're not just a bunch of attention whores here to get interviews. There's a lot of passion. Lost Circus. Again, a lot of people have not loaded in yet. Events starting in a couple of hours. I just want to show you some of the early birds um, because I'm going to be busy today. Got some great interviews lined up. They're 15 minutes, so they're going to be short bites. Got a couple of fans who I'm hoping to talk to as well for the Kiss FAQ podcast um, because that's what it's mainly about, even though I'm under the look as Rock and Roll banner this year because I want to start growing that show out with some of our non-Kiss content. Sandy Gennaro, drummer, Blackjack, many other bands. Ricky Rackman, legend, Cat House. Getting over into the vendor areas, I'm going to pretty much stay back from a lot of this because they're still going to come on in and be loading up, well, doing all their setup. So I don't want to be an ass some talent met this lovely lady yesterday lisa michelle axelrod hopefully get her on the show she's got some good kiss stories very very nice person as well Steeler, you don't see that every day rick fox first person i met yesterday came by the table said hi this guy's got some stories this guy was there at the beginning of kiss he was there at the beginning of wasp he's been a part of the music scene ron keel Anyone who's a KISS fan will have heard of Keel because of the work Gene Simmons did back in the day. That wall over there is going to be the talent, B.B. Buell. Maybe I'll get a chance. We'll see. Lots of artwork. Lots of really cool shit I've seen so far being set up here. It really is. A lot of people have come in under this roof to take advantage of the you know, situation that are being presented to them and the opportunity. It really is. The KISS room. The sexiest voice in podcasting. Matt Porter, of course. Cobra Savire, Baco. These are the Pantheon podcast partners. You got, uh, I'm in love with that song. Brad does a great show, really worth checking out. Plethora of different music, very intelligently broken down. And again, it's about passion. So, I mean, look at the professionalism out here. Podcast Rock City, Joe Polo. Actually got one of his bags. I'll be doing uh, symposiums with some of the talent today as well. Going to have Dylan Nova Scott from Vane. Incredible talent. Uh, Steve Blaze, Lillian Axe. uh, Bob Berryhill from the Safaris. Mark Weiss, photographer, legend. Stevie Rochelle. 
tough metal sludge all hail sludge uh, Sandy's gonna be up on here he played a Joan Jett as well and she is always been my guilty pleasure my first ever 45 purchase was Joan Jett I love rock and roll that started me down the path of breaking away from listening to nothing but the Beatles and John Lennon Paul Taylor from winger and Bob Chiparty concrete management foundations forum if any of you have ever watched the 1993 bootleg kiss video um they had partnered with mtv at that point so they were getting a uh, larger syndicated coverage for the foundations forum and concrete marketing but that was where kiss first really started breaking out the hardcore deep cuts that made kiss fans go freaking gaga he's gonna be here he was the brains behind that event. He had a partner early on after the formation of that company in 1984. But again, those are the sorts of industry personalities who turn up at these events every year. You've got merch, you've got toys, you've got all sorts of really cool stuff. Look at this beautiful display. You know, if you're into pop culture, ephemera, it's all here. This next vendor has got a whole bunch of really awesome stuff. Look at that wall popping with color if that doesn't get you hard nothing will some good kiss posters up there on the top too with great prices bill elliott we'll say no more there's vinyl there's art there's everything that is the rock and pot expo in nashville and just think four years ago was it five years ago 2018 the first ever rock and pod over in a tiny little space i think there were like 10 podcasts the the venue was so small i stepped on one of the nelson twins we had a great jam session at the end one uh, podcast didn't get his table yeah all right so that's the rock and pod we used, we had 10 tables the first year i think it was and one guy didn't get a table um so it's absolutely <laughs> grown a ton of vinyl um other sort of collectors podcast brothers and sisters i'm in love with that mm -hmm. song ages of rock a to z radio um podcast rock city um i'm gonna start losing track of all kiss talk um, mm. just a ton of podcasts a lot of non-kiss ones as well it really was a gathering of the tribe um, a lot of events around it there was a vip mingler over at uh, a bowling alley the night before at the rock -a pod and it had an arcade with nothing but pinball machines in it including <laughs> the kiss one um, oh yeah so that was St. Patrick's Day, so I, I couldn't drink that night because I was driving. So it was a real bummer to be in a pinball arcade, and then they <laughs> then they had a show afterwards, uh, which I didn't stay till because again I, I wanted to make sure I stayed off the hooch um, for the following day. I'd done load in that day, and when you're operating on your own, you've got to really balance things out uh, a little bit more. So the following day was the the Rock and Pod, followed by Heel Fest, um, and then Sunday things closed out with the comedians and a screening of <clears throat> Exposed, but by that time I was on the plane back to San Francisco. So absolutely incredible event. Um, we're going to go through some of the interviews today, uh, but before we do, do you guys have any news? Anything you want to chime in on? Well, I just saw on the board that they released a third single from the Poughkeepsie thing that I Love It Loud is now streaming, apparently. It will be tomorrow for uh, US, but people on the right I, side I of the time zone. Spot yeah, because I, I, it's a, there's a Spotify link on the board. Yeah, mm. well, if you're able to play it, you are, but it usually drops mm. on Friday at midnight. Okay. Uh, singles, so depending on your time zone or your VPN, you'll be able to hear that. Um, yeah, be interesting it, to it see what people... It is interesting. Sorry, I was, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just going to say, it is interesting, though, that somebody brought up that the singles that are being released from this are all Creatures of the Night songs. What's wrong with that? Nothing. I just thought it was interesting because you know because it's, it, because it's an animalized you know type true. tour. You would it's think they would true. at least put one of those songs on there, right? No, I think I well, there's I think there's only two from Animalize in the set at that point, um, and it's better to hold those back. And if you read my review on Sunday, you'll you'll probably get an idea why the the creature songs are all kind of throwaways in a sense, but they're also very good instantaneous measuring sticks to compare Mark with his. Um, well, Bruce and Vinny at that yeah. point. So it, it is kind of interesting yeah. from that point. And again, I, I think I did 2,500 words in my review. I was very long-winded as always, as I'm being right now, and I haven't even stopped to take a breath of air yet. So we'll see how long I go before I turn blue. 
<laughs> all, right, all right. So um, you guys have had a, a chance to review some of the interviews. Which one do you want to talk about first? And um, Oh, Rick Fox. Rick Fox. Mm. All right. Here's the Rick Fox interview. We'll be back at the end to uh, talk about it. Um, I'm Julian, anyway, for the KISS FAQ Rick, podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, Rick, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I want to talk to you about two bands. You were there at the beginning of both of these bands. And first of all, let's go back. It's the 50th anniversary of KISS this year. Mm -hmm. And in late 1972, I believe, you were on a fly on the wall of them rehearsing as a trio before Ace Frehley joined the band. That's a mind-blowing thing for you to have witnessed and for me to get to talk to someone who was there. Can you take us into the, those rehearsals and to what you saw and how it differed from what they became? Well, I got that. That became, well, I met Peter Chris after he got out of the band Chelsea. And his family moved around the corner from me in Brooklyn. Right. All right. So I wound up becoming friends with uh, the middle aged daughter, it was Joanne. There was an older sister, Nancy, then Joanne. And then there was a younger sister, Donna, who my friend John Alton went out with. Right. So we would, Peter would stop by his mom's house in Brooklyn on the way into Manhattan to rehearse with Kit Wayne. He put, he put the famous ad out, drummer willing to do anything to make it. Right. Which Gene and Paul saw. And, and so he started rehearsing with them and he, they became the, the trio that they became. And he would stop by and say, hey, you want to come and watch rehearsal? Sure. So we'd go up to, went to their loft to watch them rehearse. They had milk crates, you know, old milk cartons on the wall to absorb sound. It was just like it was described, paint peeling off the walls. Manhattan had a lot of buildings that had, were industrial lofts. Right. So this was, you know, a gutted industrial loft. You know, it was maybe 30 feet by 10, 30 by 12. Right. So we sit at one end, they were rehearsing the other. And the first thing I saw was Gene Simmons' SVT amp cabinet had the stencil Jack Bruce nice. on the side, which is one of Jack Bruce's cabinets from Cream. Like that. And and pretty much what we saw and, and heard them doing was the, the early initial uh, versions of what we heard on the first album. Right. You know, Strutter, uh, Firehouse, Nothing to Lose, like that, as a three piece without without the solos. And and they were rock stars at that point. I mean, you know, uh, uh, jeans, platform shoes, you know, that's how we rock, rockers dressed back then, like that. And I try to imitate that as well. And, and we just watched them go through the through the set, you know, or, or we'd move over, there was a little couch, we'd sit on that. And and Gene was trying to get us to clap, you know, on, on parts where there was a clap, you know, to clap along, things like that. We had, there was no standard to match them up to. We, there was nobody to compare them to because they didn't sound like anybody. Right. They were heavy like Humble Pie. They had catchy, uh, I don't want to say Doobie Brothers, but, you know, uh, catchy songs, right. you know, uh, really easy choruses, stuff that you could, we could leave there and remember the songs, right. like that. And then so they, there was a period where they were auditioning guitar players, and uh, uh, Bruce Kulick, his brother Bob Kulick auditioned. Uh, a lot of people, uh, JJ French from Twisted right. City, a lot of people auditioned. But when we went back up there, Ace Frehley was there, so right. he had gotten. We missed it, but he got the gig. He was wearing a gray pinstripe suit with a purple sneaker and an orange sneaker, and he's leaning against the wall. He's got his leg up like this, up against the wall. And he's playing, he's ripping leads, just like Chuck Berry on 12. Right. Kind of, you know, Jeff Beck, Jimmy Page type. And Paul's nudging him, you know, get off the wall, get off the wall, come, you know, interact with us while we're playing. And it was just, and then, of course, my friend John would bring like a six pack of Budweiser. And Ace would be, John, can I have one of your beers? Yeah. You know, and he'd finish that with John, can I have another one of your beers? He drank all of John's beer like that. And, and uh, but it was, it was like, we were, we were, I was still in high school. We were like, wow. Well, you're a Bishop Laughlin, and you were writing about him in the Jameson, weren't you? I did, yeah. yeah. How, did you, how did you find out about that? Yeah, I read an article that you wrote in uh, December 73, and you were talking about the best glitter scene bands. And it you're was. running through Sniper, which was Joey Ramone, Joey fronted yeah. them. Yeah. Um, I think you had Luger in there, Luger. ISIS, uh, Broadway, something. Turned down Broadway. Turned down Broadway. There were some bands I took pictures of at Coventry, yeah. Yeah. And Street Punk and, and Bratz and, yeah. So you were you were all around that scene, and it is of course your photographs that have been ripped off for decades. Thank you. Yes. Um, and you know I've got some in my drawer that I bought in record stores in the '80s. You know, you, you took those photos, and people basically stole them and and made money off them for you sharing. Yeah, what I did was I put together a Kiss scrapbook mm -hmm. with a leather belt and a strap on it. It's a Kiss and glitter, Kiss logo. 
when I got to California, I, I met some diehard Kiss fans, and they said, if, hey, if you ever are interested in selling anything from your scrapbook, you know, take it off your hands. I needed some money, you know, I was, I was uh, just out of Wasp. And uh, I, I took some of the pictures there. They're still mounted on cardboard. Right. And I took them and I, I you know, sold them to this guy. Little did I know, in a million years, he would take pictures of those pictures and start pirating them and selling them around the world. Right. And I would start to, when the internet was created, after a while, I started to find my pictures on the internet with other people's watermarks on them. That must piss you off, because you own the copyright to those photos. They remain your photos I to this day. I still have the negatives. Yeah. If people so. remember what negatives are, I have the negatives for them. And I have the negatives for Turn Down Broadway, for ISIS, Bratz, for Harlots of 42nd Street. You know, bands that I saw so go, uh, I went to see play at the Coventry. Right. Where, and I've got pictures of Kiss at the Coventry as well. You know, like that. And then, yeah, so my pictures were all around the world. And now when I get contacted, like uh, Destroyer Magazine, which is out of Sweden, yep, great, Swedish Kiss Army, group. They, they asked me, you know, can we, do we have permission? Can we use your photo? Yes, you can. And, you know, and I said, put a disclaimer in it, you know, like by Phil Maurice pictures of KISS, you know, from the, the press presentation. Uh, you have to put that those were my pictures, and if you see them anywhere, and my name is not on them, know that they were stolen. Right. Like that. So, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. No, it's important, because obviously, photos are worth a lot of money now. It's a, it's a big deal. Yeah. And you've missed out on that money with them getting stolen, which, you know, is not a good thing. You know what's interesting is, looking back now, decades, how many KISS conventions have there been? I've never been invited as a, as a featured guest speaker for what I bring to the table about my memories of KISS and being there. I've never been asked to be a featured guest speaker. I, we can't figure that one out. Why not? Because, I, nobody knows. again, when I saw that you're on this guest list, I'm like, Rick was there. I'm like, Rick has the stories. I mean, yeah, we're going to talk about Wasp in a minute as yeah. well. Yeah. Again, these beginnings that you were a part of is just so critically important. I want to ask you specifically about Paul Stanley as a trio. Was he not do, trying to do any lead work? Was he just continuing to do rhythm? Like, here's a space where we're going to have a lead guitarist? Or was he trying to fulfill the role as a single guitarist at all? It was mostly rhythm guitar. Right. But I think he would, he would play like... Uh, um, I don't want to say lesser leads, you know, just something simple, like the, like the harmony line or whatever, right. just, just to fill in the spot like that. But he was mostly rhythm guitar, you know, because without that rhythm guitar, you have just a bass and drums, and you have that other section of the rhythm section drop, drop out a little bit. So he'd play a little bit of lead, but he did some mostly rhythm like that. And, <laughs> well, he had an attitude back then. Did he think he's got an attitude? Well, him and Gene both had attitudes. Well, what about Peter? Because on a lot of those early recordings that we hear, we hear him shouting. You know, he's doing a lot of interaction with the crowd. He's also picking apart the arrangements and saying, hey, we did this too fast, I screwed that up. Yeah. I mean, he's a very vocal guy. Yeah, well, you know, Peter's, Peter's like your, your typical Brooks, Brook, Brooklyn Mafia gangster guy right. on drums. Uh, like that. He, he didn't take crap from anybody, you know, and, and he'd call a spade a spade. But you, you play at the King's Lounge, I'll you're going to do it. it. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was, uh, you know, don't mess with me kind of guy. Right, like before that. we talk about Wasp, I, I just want to get your take on Kiss at the End of the Road. It looks like we're finally, finally creeping towards an ending. This year. Sorts. <laughs> this year. You know, 50 years nearly to the day of their professional debut, you know, and the, those final Coventry gigs. For someone who was there at the beginning, do you have any feelings on that? I'm glad to see them succeed in what they did. Uh, they, they took it, they they raised the bar, you know. Uh, we we kind of knew back then they were going to be big. They were going to be somebody. We never knew to what level. Right. But you know, it, it's kind of like I had to use this as a, a metaphor, but like, like a proud parent. You know, from watching them in the rehearsal off, and then hearing the demo. At, I used to have a copy of the demo they did with Eddie Kramer. Right. With the, you know, the song. Because I tried to get them to play at my high school, and we got very close. But the, the people on the, on the committee that I had an answer to, they, we don't know who this band is. We don't know anything about them, so we're going to pass on it. Right. And Gene got mad. Not like, bad. well, don't be mad at me. I'm doing everything I can to help promote you guys. So then, when the when the finally uh, uh, their, their debut came on WNEWFM in, in New York, and we got to hear the album, the whole album on the air, you feel that sense of pride. Like I was there. Right. I was watched them create that. So that that you know made us feel really really good about that. And of course, then they go on the road, and then they put out the other, and then here comes Kiss Alive, you know, and then bam, everything just opened wide for them, right. you know, and, and it was like, 
each year, each tour, something new, something new. I saw them at, the, at Madison Square Garden several times, Dynasty, and, and you know, several of the tours. Right down in the front row, you know, Peter would come out, he would sing uh, 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 Beth, right. like that. And you know, to his family, his nickname was Georgie. Right. So, so I'd yell in the front, hey, Georgie! And he'd see me down, and he'd throw, throw me one of the roses, like that. Or the roadies would come out and give me a handful of guitar picks. Right. So that guy right there, give him some picks. Like that. So it felt good to be, be recognized, be part of that. You know, and then I had to step back and, and, and get involved in my own music career. But were you playing at that time, or did it inspire you? Where were you along musically yourself? My professional debut was 1975, October, at Max's Kansas City. Wow. With, with a band, I was, I was a year out of high school, and, uh, and I was with the Martian Rock Band. Right. And Max's was the legendary club in New York where the rock and punk scene was growing out of. Mm -hmm. So I was rubbing shoulders with the Ramones, Wayne County, Tough Darts, Richard Hell, uh, you know, uh, uh, The Fast, you know, and all the bands that I had seen when I was in high school, you know, or bands that would open for Kiss, you know, The Diplomat, right. like that. Now I'm hanging out with these guys, you know, which was killer, you know. Uh, um, a real quick uh, thing. I knew somebody that worked at the Palladium in New York, which was the Academy of Music. Yep. Became the Palladium. So I'd get in for shows for free all the time. Front row. Hard. Uh, this, that, and the other. And I went to see Pat Travers. With, with, uh, it was Pat Thrall, Pat Travers, uh, Tommy Aldridge, Mars Kelly. You know, it was the Boom Boom Uncle, it was the Lights right. Tour, that ever. And I'm in the front row, right? After the show, I got to go backstage. I got, took a picture with Pat Travers. We're hanging out. That's around, I want to say, 78, 78, 79, mm -hmm. right? Jump to 83. Steeler, my, my LA debut, right. we're opening for Hughes Thrall. Right. Pat, 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 uh, Glenn Hughes, Pat Thrall. Yep. Pat Thrall, after the show, I said, I said, I don't know if you're going to remember this. I said, I was in the front row for you guys at the Palladium because I thought you looked familiar. <laughs> Like I said, I said, I said I have both of your automatic man albums. By the way, he goes, "Oh, thank you." So, so I had a bonding moment with Pat Thrall, which was like incredible. He remembered me, some kid in the front row. That's nice. And I said, "Now we're sharing, playing the same show." No, no, so, that, that always feels good when that does happen. But you've taken us into L.A., which you know inevitably takes me into the Wasp story. Yeah, because you were a part of Wasp with the very formation of that band. You're in the, the first official PR photos of it. You're on the first demo. You're a founding member of Wasp, no matter what history is written around that. Fact is fact. Yep, co-founder. Co-founder. Co yeah, you, you know, Wasp is celebrating, or has been celebrating, its 40th anniversary. As someone who was there at the beginning of that, and who did not have, maybe, the joy that you should have had from that experience, what are your feelings on Blackie? So being a survivor and being able to bring that show back on the road, do you have any feelings or do you want to say no comment? Uh, see, if, we, if they bring up my name to Blackie, he'll go next question. Right. No comment, next question. Uh, I'm glad to see he did what he did. You know, he's a unique uh, writer, creator, and all that. Not everything he does is original, but then in his business, what is? Uh, they were called Sister. Yep. And my number was uh, handed off to him from some kids who were visiting in New York at the time. And uh, uh, they gave him my phone number and a, and a picture I had. He called me up from L.A. He says, he talked me into coming to L.A. to try out for his band, like that. And they, they flew me out. And I auditioned for the band. It took two days, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, the process. But sitting there watching them three-piece, now I'm back in the Kiss Loft. Right. And I'm watching... The three, Randy, Blackie, and Tony, go through the set, six, five songs. It's all right, come on up. I plugged in, and I, I played, you know, and, and so after two days, he said, all right, you got the gig. And about, you know, Blackie's car wasn't running really well back then. Mike Solon, who was the guy that picked us up at the airport, for you trivia people, Mike Solon is the bartender in the, in the, uh, uh, uh Fly to Texas video. All right. Okay. He goes, he goes, what's a gig? Okay. And he pours the, the acid on the bar. Okay. That's Mike Solon. Mike Solon is Eddie Solon's brother from Kiss. I was, was going to ask Ace if that was the connection. Guitar yeah, the sound man. So it, that says the connecting the dots. Uh, so Mike would drive us back and forth everywhere, you know, to rehearsal and whatnot. And uh, I had a, I was staying at Blackie's cottage in Hollywood. 
uh, we're now into like March, almost April. Uh, I, had, I, I got here in February, February 4th of 82, 1982. So I'm now in the band, we're rehearsing, whenever we can get Mike to drive us down to rehearsal. I get a phone call from a friend in New York, I take Blackie's phone, and I go all the way out to the courtyard. It was a, a giant avocado tree, there's leaves all over the courtyard. So I'm talking on the phone, I'm kicking over leaves. And I kicked over a leaf, and I saw it looked like a like a, a yellow jacket, a hornet. Right. So I stepped on it real quick, so it wouldn't fly up and see. And then I tipped the leaf over, and it wasn't completely dead. It was still squirming. And the way it was squirming with the stinger moving like that, it reminded me of the old uh, the TV series that ran opposite of Batman. It's called Green Hornet, and it was curved the same way as the Hornet. <coughs> and I, I go back in the house. I said, do you remember, he's black, he's watching the Yankees game on TV. I said, do you remember how you were saying, this is going to be a whole new band, we need a whole new gimmick, a whole new name, everything goes, yeah, and? I said, I got an idea for a band name. He goes, what's that? I said, Wasp. I said, I just stepped on one outside in the courtyard. He said, remember the Green Hornet logo? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's thinking, he looks up at the ceiling, he goes, Wasp. I said, it's a good idea. He goes, keep thinking like that. The next night that we were at rehearsal, we did rehearsal, we got together afterwards. Blackie, me, Tony, Randy. Blackie goes, we have a new name for the band. Randy goes, well, I wanted to call a band Hellion, because that's what they call bad kids in Texas. He said, there already is a band called Hellion up in Hollywood. And Tony goes, what's the band name? Blackie goes, Wasp. Tony goes, Wasp? Your name's a band after a bug. And I said, the Beatles? Scorpions? <laughs> Black goes, that's it. That's the name of it. So right there, that makes that's the four co-founders of a new band, right. technically speaking. And then so Blackie called up Don Atkins, some photos, yep, like that. And and he, he, Don says Blackie called me up. He's all excited. We got a bass player. We got a bass player. This, this is great, man. He sounds great. We got to do photos. So we did photos at Don Atkins' parents' house. And and uh, by the end of May, Blackie got some something up his butt. Stop talking to me. He says, we got to talk. You're out of the band. It's not wow. working. And we'd already done the demo. Right. Which I co-wrote on Master of Disaster, which was the sixth song. Mm -hmm. And some people compare that to Wild Child because the verses are very identical okay. in the arrangement. So I get, I get canned. And he goes, and you have to surrender all your copies of the band pictures. Why? I didn't sign anything. He disclaimed I didn't know like that. He goes, they're my, it's my band. I paid for the pictures. They're my pictures. It's my band. You give me back all your pictures. So the world would have never seen those pictures had I not grabbed the negatives when he wasn't home and went up to Sunset Boulevard and made more copies. <laughs> and when I came back, he knew what I did. He yeah. saw the, the negatives were gone. This time, I ditched a couple of pictures. And he goes, uh, he went off like a volcano. This guy was yelling and screaming at me like I was a red-headed stepchild. He goes, not your, not your property, you're not allowed to have those, blah, 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 blah. Give me those fucking pictures. And I had to give him what I had in my hand. Yep. Luckily, the pictures that are now out there are the ones that I stashed. And if it wasn't for those and the demo, I wouldn't be able to prove I was in the band. He knew what he was doing. He, he intentionally censored the fact that I was in the band at the very beginning. And now there are hostile Blackie Lawless fans who hate hate me. I don't know what for. And and every time I mentioned I was in Wash, these, these people get like like real hornets. They stir up a nest. They get hostile at me. Well, on that's the why I wanted you on here because I'm not going to. I, I love Wash. I'm not going to deny your existence because I'm hoping that Blackie comes around and puts you and those demos on his career encompassing Wasp box set. Would you? Would you be? Would you be open to that happening from your point of view? No, from your lips to God's ears, but I don't think that's going to be a possibility. Mm -hmm. I hate a musicians getting erased from their creativity and their role. Well, look at the damage that happened to Chris Holmes. Yeah. You know, Chris and I, after my wife passed away, Chris Holmes called me from France to give me his condolences. Because he's a cancer survivor. Yep. So he wanted to know my wife's cancer story. And then we talked about Wasp. And he told me how he got screwed over. His name was forged on a lot of the contracts. Yep. Like that, and he and I told him what happened with me before I, he was in the band. 
And, and to this day, Chris validates, and Randy Piper, it's on the internet, Randy Piper did an interview with uh, Full and Bloom. He said, so was Rick really in the band? He goes, yeah, I was in the band. And he goes, did he come up with the name Wasp? He goes, yes, I can't take that away from him. Yeah. He goes, Rick came up with the name Wasp. He goes, uh, Blackie added the periods later. Because Rick was going to, he was afraid Rick was going to sue him. Because, because he, his, uh, Blackie ripped him off, he took the name. Yeah. So that's, that's the story, and it doesn't matter if people want to believe it or not, but I mean, you know, what purpose is it to lie? If you lie, then you have to keep backing up that lie with more lies. Yep. You know, I'm, I'm for transparency, so I tell the truth. Yep. And and Blackie, you know, claims to be, you know, a Christian and like that. Born. What kind of Christian still acts like that and maintains that lie? Yep. You know, he was the one that introduced me to the phrase "the big lie," which was used uh, in, in Soviet Russia. Yep. And when I got when, at one of the books I saw in Blackie's house, when I got he had books on like Nazis and Hitler and uh, 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 all of Hitler's henchmen. Right. And they that quote was in the book about the big lie. The bigger the lie, the more outrageous it is. The more people are going to believe it. It'll take on a life of its own. That's exactly what he did by, by censoring me in the band. Well, that's a shame. You've had an incredible career. Your minders going to get you back on track. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we're going to get you moving, Rick. Thank you very much for sharing those stories. And hopefully we'll have an opportunity in the future to talk again at some length about some of your other musical projects. There's so much to cover. All right, Rick. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you for having me. All right. It's been a pleasure. All right, that's Rick Fox. And just a, a reminder, the way the interviews work at The Rock and Pod is you only get up to 15 minutes with each guest. They have a minder with them who's keeping you on track and going to escort them over to the next interview when they finish or whatever's on their schedule next. Um, and sometimes you see them a bit antsy because they're running late. So some of the interviews are a little bit shorter, some are a little bit longer. It, it's, it's all, you know, hit and miss depending on... Um, the circumstance and also how the interview mm -hmm. goes because uh, when these guys are doing a cattle call of interviews it's got to be mentally withering for them uh, throughout the day yeah. uh, Ken did, yeah. you get, did you get a chance to to check yeah. to the Rick and what were what were your impressions of that and Rick himself uh, yeah Rick seemed like a you know cool guy he seems like he has a pretty good memory of uh, things that happened back uh, back in the day and uh, he seems like a uh, you know, good guy. Um, but, uh, you know, interesting things about, uh, you know, being a friend of Peter Chris and, and then actually being the, you know, we always talk about the, the you know, would it be great to be to fly on the wall, you know, in the loft and that sort of stuff. I mean, he was the fly on the wall. Maybe you say he is the wasp on the wall, you know, yep. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, you like that. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> but yeah. Um, very cool stories um, about that, and uh, and then of course later on the the stuff with uh, with uh, the you know beginnings of Wasp uh, and Blackie Lawless and all that was <laughs> that was kind of uh, eye opening and interesting um, and, and so on. So yeah, I, I really enjoyed that that interview. It was really good. Yeah, I was looking forward to meeting Rick. Uh, you know, he has been that fly on the wall, and that's the the only question I really had for him was, you know, take us back to 1972. There were two guys, both of who, who who were still around, who were in that rehearsal loft, and I, I wanted to pick his brain and see what he could remember about Paul Stanley as the sole guitarist when, yeah. when the band that became Kiss was still a trio. And when you're asking someone to go back 50 years, uh, you know, it, it's mm -hmm. a little bit of a challenge. But Rick was really friendly. You know, he'd come by the day before, I think, um, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and chatted at, at the table. He saw my Fillmore cover of one of my books. He's like, I was there. So, yeah, and I wanted to ask him about those photos, but again, you got 15 minutes, and that's the question that I would have asked Blackie. I, when I did the meet and greet with Blackie in December, mm -hmm. I asked him about uh, Frankie Benali and Bob Kulik, memories of both of them since they had passed on. But my other question was going to be, and I only decided not to really ask it, was, you know, about that first lineup of Wasp, and you, you get to really hear Rick's perspective of that. Um, Mark, your thoughts on Rick Fox? Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I got to say that all those interviews were really well done. Um, the Rick Fox one I thought was interesting. I mean, he, Ken brought up something that I found amusing when he, Ken said he goes he had a, he had a good memory for things from the back for, for back then. But you know what? When you feel slighted and you have been slighted and you think in certain ways, 
you'll remember a lot easier than if you went through your whole career with nothing bad happening. You know, those 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 things that are under your skin will be there for a long, long time. You know what I mean? So, but of course, you know, there's, there's two sides to every story, right? We don't know what, what the, you know, yeah. the other end of it is, or maybe we do know, but I'm, I'm, I'm unaware of the other end of it. But it was interesting hearing Rick's take on it, especially like, like Julian said, being there when uh, it was just a three piece and, you know, uh, when Julian asked him if uh, Paul was doing any lead work during the time when he was playing the guitar there and how he said that he was just doing maybe just little melody lines here and there, just where there would be a lead. So it was interesting to see how they were already kind of mapping out where things could have solos and stuff like that, which is, you know, smart, you know, because then when Ace or whoever would have been in there, they could have at least said at that time, we know where you're going to do your stuff instead of guessing where it would be. Uh, the stuff with the Wasp, I thought was equally as impressive. Uh, the whole story about the negatives going back and scooping them from Blackie and stuff like that. I thought that was fantastic because, you know, hey, it, when you're in a situation like this, and, I, and this is not to belittle Rick in any which way, but obviously when you hear stories between a Rick Fox and a Blackie Lawless, tendency will be that most people will probably believe Blackie Lawless because he's some big popular guy and famous guy, but he was smart. He got the negatives. He has the evidence and the proof that all the stuff that he talked about was true. And that was, a you know, it was it was good that he did that. I mean, you know, some people say, oh, without stealing. But, you know, it, it was his photographs, like he said. So I don't think that he had, you know, I don't think that he should have felt bad or should feel bad about go, getting back there and taking them back. Because, you know, the, the, the guy was trying to erase them from history of the band. And, you know, mm -hmm. he, he even... Like like he said in the interview with Julian, he he came up with the name of the band, you yeah. know. I mean, if he wasn't in a band, who knows? The band could have been called I don't know, Concrete something, or who knows, right? You know, they, who knows what they could have been called, you know? But he 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 get he should get a lot a lot more credit than he does. And I, I think Julian brought up another excellent point was that he hasn't been interviewed men by many other podcasts why that hasn't happened is beyond me as well especially since he has so much knowledge about both kiss and wasp yeah i think he's been on decibel geek and podcast rock city before so he has been on has been on plenty of podcasts um but you know i couldn't talk to him about steeler never listened to any of that stuff and uh unfortunately rick did not play on a live <laughs> <laughs> oh he did no oh come yeah. on <laughs> All right, let's, let's move on into the next one. The, the next interview was one that was important to me. I knew David was going to be there, and I knew that he had a story as a KISS fan that went back mm -hmm. to 1974. David is one of our big supporters who shares nearly every episode, and there were two guys who watch a lot of our episodes and share them. Uh, Brian is the other fella, um, who both saw KISS in 1974. So, mm -hmm. again, with this, this first part, you know, really celebrating the 50th anniversary of the band. I wanted to get one of them on, and David saw them in Nashville. So, um... All right, David Cathy, you are a longtime supporter of my podcast, our podcast, and a whole lot of podcasts here. First of all, I want to thank you for your support and sharing all of our podcast votes. It means a hell of a lot when you do that. Well, I appreciate it appreciate that. Uh, I love the show. The guys you have on, wonderful. And I'm just a fan of all the podcasts. And anything that I can do to help you guys grow, get the word out, I'm going to do it. And you're here today supporting Rock and Pod, so thank you very much for that as well. But I wanted to talk to you because you're a hardcore KISS fan. You saw the band in 1974 during their first, you know, Kiss Sends the Country Up in Smoke tour. Yeah. Tell me about that show in April 1974. Well, I was 10 years old, fixing to turn 11, and uh, it was actually my brother who introduced me to the band, got the first album when it came out in February, and I was instantly hooked on the music because I had older brothers and they were into the Beatles and that's what got me started on that rabbit hole to metal and rock. So it was the it was the Beatles, then it went to Led Zeppelin and to Kiss. Right. And going to that show, I was like I said, a ten year old and wasn't sure what I was gonna see because 
back then you didn't have the internet you didn't have a lot of things and you I was going and when I got there to see the four members of KISS, I was amazed, I was shocked, scared, because Gene was just like, wow. And you're level. Yeah. And I was just, almost my jaw was on the floor most of the time, because I was just staring. But I was hooked, because I'd already heard the music and, you know, seeing that raw energy from Paul Stanley, to Gene Simmons, Peter Chris, and Ace. And that just, it, as an 11 year old, I was floored. I loved it. What did you make of the gimmicks that they had as part of their stage show back then? Exploding drumsticks, levitating kit, breathing fire, and, and, lots, of, and lots of smoke. There was a lot of smoke. When Gene did his blood, I thought, is this real? You know, because I didn't know at that time what I know now. And this, because they couldn't have the logo, the, sh the ceiling was, you know, it was too small. Um, was it on the side of the stage? No. Not even in there? Not even in there. Wow. And, um, but, and Peter's drum thing didn't go up as high as some of the other places where he had more room, but it was, that's what hooked me was all the thing, Paul Stanley, the way he paraded around. He did it then, and Ace Freely with his guitar. I mean, you know, they were they were tight for somebody coming out in 1974 on their first tour, but you know, they were imperfections. It's going to be, but they they knew what they were wanting to do, and they were willing to do anything to do it. Right. So, how did an 11 year old get into that show? Well. There were two shows in Nashville that year, one on the 15th, one on the 16th. One was 21 and up. The other one was an all-age show. So I got to go to the all-ages show. Plus I had you know, an older brother who was almost 20 years older than I was. Right. And he took me and a couple of my cousins to go see it. And I'll, God rest his soul, I'll always remember that. What was his name? Jerry. Jerry. So he, he introduced you to the band, and you've had a lifelong passion with him. I've seen him 61 times in 50 years. And so what other shows have you seen um, al along your career with the band? Your, your, not your career, your, your music life with the band. Just Did you see the one that came back around for Hotter Than Hell? I, I saw all of them that came to Nashville, every one of them. I saw Hotter Than Hell, you know. That was on like almost Halloween. I think it was either the day before or on Halloween. Right. Um, when I was so getting you were older, still eleven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I was getting older with friends that I went to school with that were Kiss fans, and we started driving. Okay. We hit if it was in Chattanooga, Knoxville, Memphis, Louisville. Atlanta, we went. So that's where all the the tribe went, and especially on into college. When we was in college, we would do the same thing. Right. On a tour. So seeing them multiple times on multiple tours was was cool. Did you see them at the Electric Ballroom? No. No. <laughs> okay, I brought you back down to earth. Yeah. They're good. Score one for, just, for the later doctors. It, it was just. You know, if it was local, if it was within an hour, you know, a drive that we could go to, we did it. Memphis? Yes. Lafayette? No. Okay, good. But like I said, <laughs> all, you know, the big cities, Knoxville, Nashville, Chattanooga, Atlanta, we went. Yeah. And I've been a fan ever since. So, for a fan in 74, what did you make of Hotter Than Hell when it came out sonically? I know that fans today endlessly debate the sonics of that album. For someone who was there, how did you receive it? Seeing him live and listening to him on those first three albums, I would have rather seen him live. Right. Because, you know, when you go back and listen to those albums, it just, like so many people have read, it was not... It, you, you couldn't capture Kiss unless you went to see them live. Right. And, and, and Hotter Than Hell, to me, I love everything they put out. But, like you say, it wasn't sonically there. The, 
but the concerts, that's what I enjoyed the most. What have been your most enjoyable KISS concerts throughout those 61, I think, that you mentioned that you've seen? It had to be on the one that was here in Nashville, and I'm trying to remember the year. We, it was down at the Municipal Auditorium, and at the time, you had to get there, get in line, because it was first come, it was all general mission. Right. And it started snowing. We went into the show, and after the show was over, we come out. And it was about seven, eight inches of snow on the ground. Right. And trying to get home from that was a was a journey. But seeing Kiss every year, because I'm a big Gene Simmons fan, and to see him evolve and change over the year, years and the costumes and everything, I love that stuff. My favorite of all was '77. 78. Right, Super Kiss. Yes, that was the, that was the best show. What about Vinny? No, no. Uh, mm -mm. He was a great songwriter, but I just didn't think his musical talent was for Kiss. Uh, I, did, I, I don't like his playing. I didn't like. Which is really weird because of his Jeff Beck influences. Yeah. He was a Beck player before he became a fret wanker. Yeah. But, uh, Which, just go figure. I, I just didn't think it was a fit. And I was disappointed when he was on the, the tour when he came in and replaced Ace. I didn't care for him. You're going to go to Knoxville on this final run? Or are you done? No, I'm done. You're done? Well, I saw him, uh, like I said, the 16th of April in 74. My last show was April 9th. 2019, almost 45 years to the day. Yep. I don't have any regrets. I love it. No, it's good to be able to walk away happy, and we'll always have the music. Um, I want you to give a shout out to some other podcasts that you listen to. Well, I listen to you guys. I listen to Matt Porter in the Kiss Room. I listen to Joe Polo with the podcast Rock City. Don't forget City. Sonny Pooney. For example, like Anthony. Who? Joey Casada is going to kill me. Yeah, Sonny yeah. Pooney. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I am close friends with the guys at Ages of Rock. Aren't they fantastic, that three of Yeah, I love them. They really are the three stooges. <laughs> but I love you guys. I love Mar Marcus Almighty and I love Ken and all the, all the ones. Don't forget Daniel. Mr. Wow. Yeah. Wow. But, yeah. <laughs> All right, David, Kathy, thank you for taking some time. I, I want to talk to people who are in Nashville who saw the band here in this great city. Thank, thank you very you, much. Sir. Mark, back to you. Thoughts on, on the David interview? Yeah, I thought it was really good. Like The memories of seeing the band back at that time was, was really interesting to listen to. I mean, I think that, if I'm not mistaken, because I watched all of those interviews that he did in like one succession, so sometimes information might the overlap blur. a bit. Yep. Yeah, but I'm I'm pretty sure that he said though that when he saw them the one time that they weren't even able to put up their Kiss logo on the stage. There, if, if there was there correct. was no logo for the show yeah. in Nashville. Yeah, so that was that was interesting to hear that because you know as we've seen in various books and stuff like that 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 have been out we've always seen shots of you know it side stage or low on the ground or somewhere mm -hmm. else. But on this show there was no banner no uh, no Kiss sign at all. So. I was thought that was that was fascinating, but by the sounds of it, they made it up made up for it with a lot of smoke, and you know maybe they bumped up the pyro a little bit, or who knows, right? But he definitely made it sound like it was a show worth remembering. And like once again, if he remembers a show from 1974 in detail like that, then that's got to tell you how impactful it was on his mm -hmm. psyche and his memory. I mean, just fantastic stuff. And I got to thank him as well for you know helping post the shows all the time when he's watching them and reposting them. It, it's been an incredible help for us, I'm sure. And all the kind words that he said about me and Ken and Lonnie and, and all that, I mean, we really appreciate it. And I really appreciate it too, so thank you very much. Yeah, a lot of people came over to the table and said hi. There were several Kiss FAQ t-shirts. And, oh, really? you know, I, I do thank everyone who came over and said hi or came over and I only had a very limited amount of books of me because of uh, travel weight, but who, who purchased books from me. You know, it, it was nice for them to talk about the shows and to have, you know, the other podcasters there as well. I mean, it was really awesome from that perspective and we do appreciate you. We're not going to, you know, call you names or 
you know. Well, David didn't play yeah. on the live either. So, uh, Ken, what were your thoughts on that interview? <laughs> because he's, he saw Kiss before you. He did. Mm-hmm. He's a lucky guy. I'm, yeah. That's, I'm jealous, you know. Um, but, yeah, I agree. Um, well, first of all, th- you know, thank you to for being a supporter, obviously, um, of our podcast. So I want to just kind of, you know, on top of Mark's there, uh, say thank you. And then, um, yeah, I mean, he's seen Kiss, well, early at the beginning, and plus, you know, what do you say, 61 times, I think he said, something yep. like that. Um, and, uh, but I, you know, the interesting thing, too, uh, uh, that he said was about, you know, the music on those early albums. And then, but again, like we've said many times, too, is they're, they're all, those songs are better. Those are, they're, when they're played live, that's that's the best version of Kiss, um, is the live version of Kiss and the, and those songs being played live, you know, like Black Diamond, Cold G, and all those, you know, oldies, um, <laughs> call them oldies now. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good. Movie. He's a passionate guy about the band and and about Kiss, and it's obvious um, he's you know a big fan, and and it was it was enjoyable to hear his, you know, kind of history of Kiss. Yeah, and as a Kiss fan who, you know, got on the uh, on the train in um, 1985, I can't go back to be a, an original fan who heard the first album when it was in stores and then heard right. Hotter Than Hell for the first time and saw the shows in that period. I can never get right. that. So it's only from people like David and, and Brian sharing <laughs> you know, their stories that we can actually live vicariously through their memories. So, yeah. you know, it, it, it's it's very cool. All right, next interview is uh, Bob Chaparty. And Bob, this interview came along late and, you know, was asked if, there was a, a, an ask if anyone wanted to interview him. I didn't know who he was. I quickly Googled him and he was Foundations Forum. And, of course, really? <laughs> for KISS fans, um the 1993 Foundations Forum bootleg is one of those outstanding moments in history where they dug out all the old songs. So I wanted to just, you know, some softball questions about Foundation Forum. Here's Bob. Uh, Bob, good to meet you. Good to meet you. Thank you for taking time to join the KISS FAQ podcast to My talk pleasure. about your your industry experience and you've got with you? I got my son here, Angelo. Hey Angelo, good to see you. you too. Thanks for coming out with your dad today. Thanks. He just turned 11. Well, happy Yesterday. birthday. Well, happy birthday. Thank you. Well, you what I want to talk to you about is clearly uh, Concrete Marketing Foundation's forum. Okay. And um, the history of that industry organization in Los Angeles led to, I'm going to jump into the middle, 1993. Okay. And that is, of course, KISS. Ah! And how did booking an act like that or getting an act like that to appear at the Foundation's Forum? Because it really set up a big part of their history in that show. They brought a lot of their rare songs back into the set. Right. And it was shown on clips on MTV. Well, we had been working with KISS for a number of years at that point on the marketing side. Right. Working their albums. So we had a great relationship, with, especially with Gene. Um, we used to call him Uncle Gene. And, uh, <laughs> he'd, he'd been a keynote speaker a couple years he, before. He, he was a keynote speaker at the first Foundation right. Forum. So going back '89. So that's so we like I said we had a great relationship. I mean, I a number of great Gene stories. Um, but uh, it was a it was an honor to be able to to have them perform at that. Like I said, that very critical time and you know as far as where they where they were band wise right and what they were doing and to be able to bring the, the, the hardcore fans songs that they hadn't heard in years right. live it was you know it was it was a, it was a great it was a great night without a doubt right so how did foundations forum get started as um, you did found concrete marketing in 1984 I believe right. with you had a partner at the I time had a partner at the time Walter O'Brien um, we were managing Grim Reaper. Van went into, was off the road and started uh, working on the second record. And we had no income because they were writing and getting, you know, working on the new record. So we had, well, how do we make money? Oh, well, let's offer our expertise we learned with the band. Right. So the record label, the record labels had no clue at the time how to deal with heavy metal music. They had no clue. 
So we had toured the, 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 the country with Grim Reaper and we made all these relationships at retail stores, at metal radio stations, at you know fanzines mm -hmm. and publications and like we were um, we were Lon Friend who ran Rip Magazine. We yep. met him. He was at the time he was a publisher at Hustler Magazine. And our publicist at RCA, wonderful woman, uh, passed away. Her name is Pat Baird. She calls me up and says, listen, I got this request for an interview from Hustler Magazine. Because I'm not dealing with Hustler Magazine. If you want to deal with them, I'll give you the number. I go, yeah, I want to. <laughs> so I called up Lon. And, he was like, and we were the first rock, what do you call it, uh, interview um, in Hustler Magazine with Grim Reaper. We went down there. We did a whole photo session with a couple of the Hustler girls. It was, it was a blast. So the scene was just emerging right. and we were right there while it was happening and we got into the ground floor by, by meeting everybody and, and making these relationships and then we just offered it up to labels. So the first record that we worked was Armored Saint Delirious, no Delirious Nomad. Right. The, the head of marketing was Rick Dobbins, and when I was in the mail at Arista Records, um, I had met him there, and when I left Arista, went on my own, and I, you know, call, I, I met, oh, I actually saw him at another convention, at, at New Music Seminar, I ran into Rick, how are you doing? He goes, I oh, hear you're, you're promoting heavy metal. I go, yeah, he goes, I got this band named Delirious Nomad. I'm never gonna, this band, uh, Armored Saint, the new record, Delirious Nomad, I'm never gonna get on the radio. I'll give you 500 bucks a week to work on it. Great. Right. <laughs> Start of a company. There you go. The second the second band we worked on was Metallica, Kill Em All. Johnny Z hired us because, God bless you, Johnny Z passed away not too long ago. Great, great man. Um, he hired us because um, Ride the Lightning was coming out, and mm -hmm. he wanted to basically coattail on all the people that was going to go on for Ride the Lightning and right, promote yeah. Kill 'Em All and, car, and all the, uh, everything else. Yeah, and, that, and so we worked out for him, and everything is kind of blossomed from there. So, what were some of the services that you do to promote these and get the word out about these albums and artists? What, we, you know, we, what would, the task? we started off with. Two, two basic areas. We started off with um, retail, mm -hmm. so calling record stores. Uh, we would, you know, there were record stores that specialized in heavy metal. There was, you know, there was a, a good amount of those, but even more so, it, uh, even like the like the Tower Records or Sam Goody's or any of the, the the chain stores. There was always a kid in there that was a heavy metal fan. Right. And we would get, we would find out who that was, and then we would we would promote. Promote, we would send them um, POP material, posters, play copies, things like that. Right. We were on the road with Grim Reaper. We'd go and we'd, you know, we'd be after the show. We're hanging out at the at the RV. We couldn't afford a bus at the time, um, and you know all these you know bands and kids that worked at record stores and kids that worked at metal radio stations. We want to meet the band, and we start talking with them, and they say, "Yeah, work at the you know at the." Joe Blows Records, you know, and uh, and we, we, we could really use some posters to go, well, don't you have, well, no, well, the only way we get posters is, is that the the, the uh, one stop that sends us our records, they, they use the posters as packing material. All right. <laughs> you know, so that, that's what metal was. It was like, it was at the back of the bus. It was, right. you know, it was like treated like a dirty tissue, you know, no one wanted to really handle it. So it was a perfect opportunity for us to come in, concert marketing, and, and, and service everybody. So you, the first Foundations Forum, I think, was reported having about a thousand attendees. Right. And you ballooned from there. You had right. a very rapid growth. Well, we expected, we were, we were expecting 500 people the first year, and a thousand showed up. Right. And it just blew from there. It, it it was the biggest one we had was like 5,000 people in 1991. That was the year we had um, we had Temple of the Dog played. We had Ozzy headline. We had Preacher Extreme played that year. Um, who else played that year? Uh, I think Pantera played. Right. 10 years of it. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes the years L kind of L melt together. Acts, all becomes yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. But it was it was amazing. Uh, it was amazing conference. Uh, Kevin Lyman did all our production. He, you know, he was the owner of, uh, of Warp Tour. Right. He would come in. We'd be in like a, a large hotel, 
uh, with a big ballroom about the size of this, this room we're in now. And we set up one stage on one side and a smaller stage on the other side. And we just went from band to band. We did like eight bands a night. A uh, head, you know, a, a more established band and a baby band. And we just right. went back and was one. The one stage went dark, the other one lit up. Right. And it was it was just such a safe environment because you know in L.A. to go from club to club you had to you would have to drive. So right. here you could be in the hotel. And that's you how you're doing it towards the end of the foundation. That's how we did that it towards the end. We spread it out towards the end. It was like it was. Looking back, it wasn't a great choice. Right. Um, the last 97 we wound, did we do, I think, we, I think the last one we did, we did it all in one place again. Right. We experimented for two years and it didn't, uh, it was tough. It but was it seemed tough. to have a really robust run from 91 yeah, had a to, run. you know, 95-ish. Even, even, even the last year in 97, it was, it was you know, the, the convention was great. It was just, it was very expensive to run. Right. And I think I think I lost 150 grand for each of those years. Um, you know, and, and the best year, I think we made 500 grand. So it gave you right. the, the, the difference of, you know, success to people who attend and success to, you know, to the guys who are running it, that they can afford to run it again. Two different things. And you partnered with MTV. You, you were we able to get syndication. Well, we didn't partner with them. We just we, we just provided such a great avenue for them that they, you know, Ricky Rackman would come down. I got to go say hi to him. I see he's got a booth over there. Um, he would he would come down and all the bands that they were covering were there, so they could they would spend a whole episode right. just based on on Foundation's form every year. So while we didn't partner with them, we we did a lot of you know we gave them carte blanche to you know to do whatever you know to. Get involved in everything that they, you know, they wanted to. When you come to an event like this, um, do you feel that this is kind of a resurgence of this kind of of uh, industry crossover for a modern I, paradigm? I think it's great. I mean, I love seeing this. It's, you know, it's it's just great to get people out out of their houses and away from their computers and the internet and just, just interact live and you know see everybody and, and intermingle with and everybody. And we're all face to face again. Exactly. Which is this absolutely is, amazing and wonderful. It's amazing. It's great on two levels. One, you know, we have, you know, post COVID on one level, but also just just to see people interacting again and not pressing buttons and you know having a superficial relationship with a, a friend, quote unquote, you know? Could the Foundations Forum exist in today's music environment? There's been talks. I mean, I, I, I consult with Revolver Magazine and I've talked with the owner there and we talked about maybe bringing it back mm -hmm. uh, with Revolver being the, the, the main sponsor. So, you never know. We'll see. Never right. say never. Last question is, who's your biggest miss? Four foundations that you wanted to bring in that you were never able to reel in or oh. get. Wow, that's a great question. Because I noticed on one one foundations you got two members of Aerosmith down. No, yeah, we had no I, Joe and Steve. No Joe and Steve. We had the yeah we had we had two if not three of them down. Um, you know we had we had two of the guys from Rush. No, three of the guys from Rush um, down. We had. With, with Van Halen, you know, they didn't play. You know, it was the year that they they uh, we did a press conference at Foundations where they announced Gary Sharon right. being a new singer. Um, but as far as playing, well, here's here's a little something that uh, you may remember. It was I think the year was 19, I think it was 91. Um, Pearl Jam was supposed to play, but. A song of theirs was taking off, and they needed to do a video real quick. Right. And the video was Jeremy. Oh, okay. So <laughs> you lost out to Jeremy. I lost out to Jeremy. So if you're gonna let lose out for a reason, that was a that was a pretty honorable reason. And their product manager, I'm still very close friends with Mark Wright. I mean, Bob, I hate to do this, but I at, need at to. least you didn't lose out to something that was a bomb. Yeah. So. All right, Bob. Well, thank you very thank much you for taking so much. the time to join us and explain Appreciate a bit it. about Foundations Forum. My thank pleasure. you very much. Thank you very much. All right. So Foundations Forum, again, that bootleg, I think uh, they did Going <clears throat> Blind for the first time electrically in mm. decades of that show. Uh, there have actually been upgrades of that that have showed up on YouTube in the last year. It really is an in incredible performance where 
you know, they, they just got out and slayed. Uh, so, Mark, as a guy who's gone to NAM industry, you know, you're an industry dog as well as, you know, mm-hmm. from, in your history. You know, what, what takeaways did you get out of the Bob interview, if any? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I, th- I thought it was interesting because I've been to these concrete foundation forums. I actually went to one mm-hmm. of them in uh, 94. I think it was the one right after the KISS one. So I was kind of like, dope, you know, when I realized that I had <laughs> missed KISS, you know, the, the year before. I went to it when they had uh, Bruce Dickinson was there uh, when he was promoting uh, Skunk Works at the time, that album. Yeah. He was around in California there. And I had seen uh, uh, D. Schneider's new band that he had then at the point. I forget what the band was called, but he had a different band at the time. Widowmaker. Widowmaker. Yeah, that's it. Mm. And... Uh, that's what I saw. Ingve live. I saw. I saw Dream Theater live because they had like they had at the, in the evenings afterwards after you know the old schmooze fest during the day, they had a big concert at the end of the night at the ballroom, and that's when I saw Dream Theater, who had just lost Kevin Moore. They had just released Awake at the time, and he they were playing with a newly found Jordan Rudis at the time, who hadn't even been into band yet with them at that time. So it was interesting to watch that show. Uh, and of course, Ingve screwed everything up because he set his guitar on fire, and everybody had to evacuate the ballroom. So everybody <laughs> hated Ingve that night. Uh, <clears throat> so, but yeah, he it unleashed was unleashed the fucking fury. Yeah, he did in, indeed. Uh, but it was a good show. He played really good, Ingve. I had to say. But uh, I'd liked his memories, Bob, uh, about it because a lot of the stuff that he talks about is from a time period that was really just starting to get really deep into music. You know, he talks about starting up the management firm because I'm pretty sure that he also concrete and those guys uh, with Walter, I think they started managing Pantera and bands like that yep. uh, later on, right? So th- th- then Pantera was like numero uno on my list when I was young. I mean, we were covering Pantera in our sets when I was in my band, you know. So to hear back all these memories about the stuff that he was involved with, it, it it impacted me a lot because I remember being there front and center and I remember going to these concrete things. And one of the things I loved about it was as soon as you walked in to one of these events, they're like, hi, what's your name? They you give them a name. They give you this little pass. They clip it on you and they give you this humongous bag. You know, like you keep hearing about these bags like they, at all these kind of like award ceremonies. They did that there as well. Huge bag, big bag program tons of sample cds like four cd packs from from record labels of like all kinds of stuff when we got back to the hotel and we dumped it on the bed we were there for hours looking at stuff from different mm-hmm. bands bands we've never heard of labels we've never even heard of before so these things were really a great to go to and it was my first trip to california so that, that in itself was mm-hmm. really uh, impactful to me and of course we ended up in a bad part of t- town like we were in north north hollywood boulevard when we told when we told the uh taxi guy where our hotel was he looked at me he goes no no bad area bad area and i go what do you mean bad area he goes i don't drive there i go what do you mean we have, we have to go back to our hotel so apparently we were in a bad area and there was gunshots we went to the taco bell at night and we literally heard like gunfire so well, all he was right yeah but that's, hey, that's i was normal. a canadian I was a Canadian young, 20 years old, going to my first sort of convention out of the country. It was a bit of an eye-opening experience. So it was good memories listening to this. That was one of the fun things this year at Rock and Pod, actually, was there were people, I, every time i turn around, there'd be like another swag, a swag bag on the side of my mm-hmm. table that someone would have dropped uh, bio. Um, and one of the bands that came by was Blackwood. And I, nice. I checked them out. I'm going to do a Look It's Rock and Roll podcast episode about these guys. I don't know if I'll reach out maybe and, and get one of them to talk about this stuff. Uh, but check them out on, on, on YouTube. It's actually a good American hard rock, which um, is very interesting. Ken, you're a consumer of bootlegs, so no doubt you've seen Foundations Forum many times. And mm-hmm. what were your thoughts on that one? Well, no. I mean, I haven't been to Foundations Forum or anything. I mean, I've seen the – of course, I've seen the you've, videos. You've seen the, sh- the videos. Oh yeah, I've seen the videos and so on. So well, you can uh, thank which, Bob for them. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I know. Yeah, well, thank you, Bob. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was cool seeing or hearing some some of the you know origins of it of the Foundations Forum and how you know he, for instance, expecting right the five hundred or something to show up and he got a thousand, then it kept growing every year, kept getting getting bigger and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it was really interesting and in how he, you know, 
got these guys to to come and and put on this you know show and and so on so every year and i thought that was you know really cool cool thing yeah i mean when we're at an event like rock and pod it's kind of similar that it starts out yeah. as a grassroots event and obviously they had the marketing arm uh they're working with grim reaper so you know they were kind of ahead in what they oh, were yeah. doing but chris and his team are, are doing a very similar sort of thing in music city in building an event that brings musicians and music podcasters and fans together um which, which is you know just really really cool all right all right, that's it for this episode. We're going to be back with a part two for the rest of the interviews from Nashville Rock and Pod. Thank you for spending time listening to the Kiss FAQ podcast today. All sales are final, there are no refunds. If you'd like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the Kiss FAQ message board and discuss the topic we've broadcast today. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, Spreaker, or wherever you've listened to the show. We hope you'll join us again.